All of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors or stuntmen, but everything you see and hear is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct events as they happened. Tonight on 999, the passenger who fell out of a jet aircraft and lived to tell the tale. The man brought back from the dead whose heart had to be pumped two and a half thousand times. And Holiday Hell, the chain reaction that destroyed their boat and the lockkeeper who braved the blast to save them. It's the dream of many flying enthusiasts to own their own jet. To private pilots, this jet provost is the Ferrari of the skies. It's owned by businessman Tom Maloney. He bought it from the RAF, where it was used for the basic training of their pilots. Within days of taking delivery of the jet, Tom offered to take his younger brother, Des, up for his first flight. It's an experience neither of them will ever forget, a flight which deepened the bond between them after the most bizarre accident. In this reconstruction, the two brothers are played by actors. Go around there. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Obviously, we were both excited about the prospect of flying. It was the first time we'd flown together in the aeroplane. It was uh, an experience we were going to share. Be comfortable. Yeah, it's quite small, isn't it? Good. Now look, we're going to make sure that you're strapped in, all right? It's very important, the safety aspect, and uh, I was very careful on that particular day, as I would be on any day, on briefing whoever the passenger was on, on the uh, safety procedures. So we spent probably 15, 20 minutes maybe going through all the systems on the aircraft, but particularly the abandoning procedures. The procedure basically was in two parts. Firstly, if you have to get out, then the canopy will be removed and then you will jump out over the wing, which is uh, frightening but straightforward. And then the second part is obviously you have to pull your manual ripcord. Um, what I have to do first of all is jettison the canopy, which is this lever down here. Yep. You don't touch that. That's when the plane was taken out of service with the RAF, the ejection seats were disarmed. In an emergency, Des would have to free himself from his seat by pulling the release lever. Yeah. Okay, and then once you're clear, you have to pull your D-ring here. You're kidding. Hey, Rick, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> This is my baby brother, so uh, I've got to look after him. So make sure he knows what he's doing. It was a very bright day, and uh, Desi was obviously very securely strapped in. He couldn't quite reach his sunglasses. I can't get my glasses, Tom. How do I undo this? No, don't worry about your glasses. I'm not taking that one off of you. Use your visor, OK? So he popped down the visor. That was a fortuitous thing to do. We finished the, the safety briefing, and uh, all the pre-flight checks were done, and we're ready to go. There was a small crowd of people waiting by the side of the aeroplane, including my girlfriend, Kay. And I remember sort of giving her the thumbs up and opening the power and off we went. Just as we were taxiing out to the uh, runway, the holding point, he once again said, Tom, where's my uh, ripcord? Where's that D-ring for the parachute again? Oh, it's down here. Don't worry. That was quite strange to me because out of all the things going on inside this cockpit, this aeroplane, that was his only question. It was the one uh, part of the breathing I thought was particularly uh, relevant. If you can't find the ripcord, then... Um, you're in trouble. A jet is something special. I mean, there is a saying, jet noise is the sound of freedom. It's quite true, actually. It's a rush of air. It's, it's very smooth. We're, we're flying along and uh, really enjoying the view, and it's, uh, the visibility from this particular aircraft is superb. And Desi was enjoying himself. Just take a look over the side down there. It's amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? Do you want me to do a roll? Uh, you must. During the roll, neither of them noticed that Des's seat was working loose. <laughs> then Tom said to me, did you like that? And I said, uh, yeah, that's fine, I lied. And then we, then we did one to the left, and that's when um, things started to become uh, more real. I do another one. <laughs> the horizon moved. My seat started to uh, knock up and down. I knew instantly something was wrong. Uh, there was a, a sort of like a crack. 
I actually caught my hand on the seat as it was passing through the car, instantaneously realising he had just fallen to his death. Mayday, mayday, mayday. I was flying this aircraft, which really didn't particularly want to fly very well at the time. And I remember trying to regain control of the aeroplane, and it was upside down, and then the right way up. And he pulled quite a lot of G, trying to get back to the spot where he'd come out. My immediate feelings were that he was um, going to be killed because he was still sitting in the chair. He would have been spinning round and round, and unless he could have remembered how to separate himself from the, the chair and then push the chair away physically and then go for his ripcord, he had a lot to remember. I was um, in a pretty bad way. I remember sort of smashing my fist on the cockpit and the panel and screaming a bit, um, but really just thinking, my God, he's just been killed. I spotted a disused airport, and I really just wanted to get out of that aeroplane. And I'm setting up for an approach, gear down, flaps down. My mind's thinking fast. Well, what if I land there? There's nobody there. So if there's nobody there, I can't get to theirs. So I put on full power, raise the gear, and continue towards uh, North Weald. I remember very well uh, the flight back. It was probably 15, 16 minutes, and it was the longest time in my life. By coincidence, a BBC camera crew there filming another story captured the moment when Tom landed with the smashed cockpit clearly visible. They didn't really know what I was talking about. They hadn't really worked out what had gone wrong there. I just kept on saying, um, you know, Des is dead, you know, he's been killed. And uh, of course, you know, it's an enormous shock. You couldn't believe that it could have happened. Um, but I just kept on repeating it over and over again. And then Kay came running up to me and you know, she hugged me and I'm just saying, Des, he's, you know, he's dead, he's dead. I don't remember going through the country as such. The first thing that hit me was the wind speed. It, it, um, I think it knocked the wind out of me. It was very, very fast. There's lots of lights, lots of pressures from all different directions. Time is instant, you can't go back. And that's one of the things which occurred to me on the way down. You can't sit down and have a cup of tea and think about it. It's, it's, it's happening. It is very brutal. But somehow he got free of the seat. Somehow he managed to open the parachute. He was safe, but he didn't know about his brother. I landed quite heavily. I fell to my side, which is apparently the right thing to do. The first thing I felt was, OK, that went OK, I'm down. I did a 360-degree look to see where I was and where I should walk. There was civilization. And then people started to come over. A gentleman running. And I think he noticed that I was in a shocked state. So he took charge of the situation. Then the pain started to come on a little bit more. My brother could be dead. One person mentioned that they had seen something fall was a dark black object. There was no shoot. If that had been my brother, then there was only one conclusion to draw. And that is that the plane had gone down and my brother was probably dead. I was led away to a police car. It was a Horrible experience, sitting in the car, you know, waiting for news. Um, I'm really just expecting them to say on the radio, you know, we found his body in the field. And uh, they just couldn't get any information out of the police for a while, because they were obviously trying to locate him, and maybe was still rushing around trying to figure out what, what had gone wrong. Have you heard the news? The aircraft this man fell out of has landed safely. Oh, thank God. Is, is he all right? Yeah, the pilot's perfectly OK. Oh. He was the first person, the ambulance man, with a radio, you actually knew the situation. And um, that was just great news because it's confirmed um, and your worst fears have been allayed. Go from here, 4 2, go ahead. Yeah, getting reports of an incident in the Colchester area. Um, somebody's fallen from an airplane. Is he alive? It must have been 45 minutes before. Uh, a call came through to say that it, actually he was alive, but he was severely injured. Oh, you can't be alive. I cope with it very badly. Um, you know, there's my brother, and uh, he's my younger brother as well. It's my responsibility to look after him. Um, so I, 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 it was a very difficult period. You know, that, that drive to the, uh, the hospital lasted a long time. I had a tag around my wrist which said um, man has fallen out of the aeroplane at 3,000 feet. Um, the staff reacted in a kind of surprised way to that and also um, the other patients in the hospital. I think they found it quite amusing as well. 
Despite appearances, Des had suffered no serious injuries. I said something like, reports of my death are premature, um, and that broke the ice. And then uh, we just basically held each other. Listen, I thought you were dead. I just can't believe this. It was pretty, pretty amazing. I don't think I've ever kissed him before. <laughs> I don't think I probably ever will again. <laughs> Fine, though. Within two days, Des was released from hospital. <laughs> I think there has been some good to come out of this. It does show that training, yeah. briefings are very important. He's got a sore neck. I Fortunately, uh, a lot of good things happened that saved him. Um, he separated from the seat. He did hit the tailplane of the aircraft on the way up. And, you know, it's a size 10 boot mark on the fin. Um, but he didn't get knocked out. He couldn't reach his sunglasses, so he had the visor down. So as he penetrated the canopy, he, uh, he was protected by the visor, um, which helped a, a great deal. But most of all, though, his, his own coolness at the end of the day. It's changed my attitude to some things um, since. It makes you think in greater detail about other people. And obviously, um, that's all you had in the end. We've always been pretty close anyway, um, but we are now closer still. Um, he's not allowed to fly with me anymore. The Thames at Putney, the starting point, of course, for the annual university boat race. The concrete slipways here make it easy to get the boats in and out of the water. It's a luxury you don't often find on white water rivers running through open country, where finding a safe place to land can often be a difficult business. That's precisely what led to a fight for survival by three students who went to canoe the River Conwy in North Wales. When things went wrong, a BBC News crew went with the emergency services for what turned out to be a most unusual and technically difficult operation by a mountain rescue team. In our reconstruction, the rescuers play themselves but experienced canoeists take the part of the three students. Right, this is the get-in point. You're going to paddle in down, a few rapids, round the bend. The get-out point's here, small shingle beach with a white post. This is the last get-out point. Make sure you get out here, OK? Otherwise, if you go any further, end up over Conway Falls. You're happy with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go, then. That weekend was the first time I paddled with either Gareth or Jim. Because he was one of the older members of the team um, and reasonably experienced, not vastly experienced, I felt almost responsible for the sort of younger guys who were really very enthusiastic, perhaps a little bit too enthusiastic. There were seven in the group and we had all been wet water canoeing before to varying degrees. In terms of the competency of the party, the river was well within everybody's grasp, really. You've got to plan your route and think about safety precautions. You know, you've got to make sure that you, you get your line right or there's, there's going to be trouble. The get-out point on this river was a small shingle beach with a white post. We realised we'd actually gone past this point when the river changed. I turned to see Jim, who was obviously in trouble. The water was flowing quite fast. Things were happening all around, so I had to think really quickly. Gareth realised that Jim was being swept towards the gun barrel, the stretch of the river which funnels the water to the treacherous Conwy Falls, just 150 yards downstream. Got to an area where I could wedge my boat so that I could safely get myself out and get into a position on this central rock in the river. the river was in control of him and I just didn't want to see him go down there, you know. Run this way, out of smoke! Run, Jim! It was a case of pull him over, get him into safety. We saw Simon come down. Both of us were shouting to Simon, keep left, keep left, keep away from the drop. We got Simon out of his boat, made sure his boat was safe. 
It was at that stage that we were waiting for the rest of the group, the rest of the party. But they'd managed to get out further upstream. We looked up over the bridge and they were shouting us from the top of the bridge. We started to think how on earth they would actually manage to get us off. We had no idea of what our friends were thinking or doing up on the bridge because we couldn't really communicate with them because of the noise of the water. It was six o'clock, the light was fading. They sent a rope down, which they hauled two boats out and the three paddles to get them out of the way. They'd already been stranded on the rock with the water rising around them for almost an hour. As darkness fell, their friends raised the alarm. The police got there first, closely followed by the Ogwen Valley Mountain Rescue Team and one of their team leaders, Roger Jones. A BBC News crew arrived and began taking these remarkable pictures. It had been raining heavy all day and it was uh, apparent that we were going to have to get these lads off uh, pretty quickly or uh, they were going to be washed off. I kept pointing to the water and then making this sort of gesture. Um, to, to remind them that it was coming up. No chance would anybody be able to swim or get to, to the river bank. Uh, it was just impossible. You got your wetsuit with you? Yeah, I've got my wetsuit, Rog. In the forces, there's a, an axiom to never volunteer. Well, always be careful what equipment you take. You might end up volunteering by default. I was one of the few people who owned a wetsuit and was daft enough to turn up with the wetsuit in my rucksack. Put a belay. Starting off on Neil's motor. The plan was to construct a cat's cradle of ropes to lower Doug down the 80-foot gorge and lift the canoeist to safety. It was a mountain rescue technique they'd practised but never used in this way before. First, they had to secure the main anchor rope. The whole operation depended on it. OK, watch the edge here. Don't get too close. There were now 30 people on the bridge helping with the rescue. I know at one particular stage there seemed to be a sort of frustration, really, of people on the bridge seeing the water rising and, and lots of mountain rescue people fiddling around with ropes, for want of a better word, and nothing really happening. They seemed to be there an awful long time before anything happened, and that was extremely worrying and frustrating. We were saying to each other, you know, what the hell are they doing up there? Let's have a figure of eight. Everything had to be checked and, and laid out correctly Jeez. before the commencement of the rescue. OK, lads, on belay. All right, let's right. go back to the edge. Someone pass the buoyancy aid. The boundary between apprehension and fear is, is very blurred, but um, I was certainly frightened going over there. That first putting your weight onto the rope was done very, very gingerly indeed. Once you're hanging on the rope, then you almost accept that as the norm. It had taken an hour to rig the aerial ropeway, a system of pulleys and the two ropes. The mountain rescue team used them to control Doug's movements. One group could swing him from side to side and the others could move him up and down. One rope was tied to a Land Rover on the bridge, and the second was round a tree near the water's edge. But almost immediately, there was a problem. The rope went into some branches of a tree. And there was a few anxious moments while I tried to snap off branches with my hands. I was considering having to send back for a saw or something, but I managed to snap the branches off and the, the rope came free. The thing that made this frightening and different was the noise. The noise was, was so terrific that it drowned everything else out. We use hand signals for directing helicopters. They're very simple. You wave your hands up and down, it means go up or go down, and you point them sideways, and it means go sideways. Once I realised that I couldn't shout over the noise of the river, um, I just used those hand signals automatically. My greatest fear was that they were going to try and grab me. So as soon as I was within what I thought was earshot of them, I was shouting at them to just sit still, let me do all the work, don't you do anything. I was going to be glad to get off this rock, you know, sitting on a rock for three hours is no, um, you know, it's no easy task. 
the river was still rising. I've got absolutely no doubt anybody falling into that water would have died. You, you, there's no way you'd come out of that alive. If you stayed on the surface of the water, you'd have been battered and smashed. If you went underwater, you'd have been pinned and drowned. Nice and steady. Nice to see, to see Gareth go to safety. And Doug sort of disappearing back up the road was a bit eerie, really. And just Jim and I left. Cheers, lads. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. At that point, I felt for Jim a little bit because I thought, well, Jim's going to be left here completely on his own, which must have been really, really eerie. As Doug plucked me off the rock, I got a full sort of aerial view of our situation, which made it really apparently clear that it was very serious. And had we gone any further, that would have been that would have been it, I think. The worst moment of the, the whole evening was when I was left there. The lights that had all been set up followed them up. I was left on my own on this rock in, in the bottom of the gorge in total darkness, thinking whether they would actually come back down for me, whether at this last moment I would get caught by the water and, and taken off the rock. And it was a great relief again when the lights did come back and Doug came back down the rope system to get me. We swung out into the air and really appreciated and saw the power and felt the whole aura of the water and environment we were in. And that was really exciting. When we got changed and had been checked out by the ambulance people, we went down to the rescue team and thanked them for all the hard work they'd put in. And it was amazing to see the amount of activity there had been on the bridge just to get us off the rock. It's not the glory, it's, it's the comradeship of being involved. It's, it's having a group of people who, who do a job and enjoy doing it. We're all mountaineers. We, we mountaineer for our own enjoyment and fun. Most motorists would admit there are often occasions when the last person on earth they'd want to meet is a traffic warden. But angels come in many guises, and this week's lifesavers are two traffic wardens who came to the rescue of a 65-year-old woman in North Shields. Nora Proud and her friend Shirley Drew were doing their weekly shop when Nora, played here by an actress, complained she was having trouble breathing. They tried to get to a shop they both knew well, but before anyone could help, Nora collapsed with a heart attack. Might have been traffic warden for six years. We carry a, a radio. Uh, we wear a uniform. People look at us as if we're there to help them. Uh, we're a bit like uh, a police officer around the town centre. Excuse me, there's a lady collapsed in the wool shop. I don't think she's very well. Right, I'll see what I can do, thanks. Hi, what's happened? It's collapsed, had a heart attack. Uh, the shopkeeper was obviously done? keeping her going, but I noticed he hadn't loosened her uh, clothing, so I unfastened her clothing uh, to make it easier for her to breathe. I realised she desperately needed um, an ambulance. And there was no, I noticed there's no phone in the shop, so I got on my radio. Whiskey 9838 12 be urgent. Can I have an ambulance, please, at Rudyard Street, the wall shop? I was only a, a couple of streets away uh, when I heard the radio message, and I thought, by Paul's tone, it's fairly urgent, so I'd better get down there quick to see if I could help. Kev, can you start doing mouth to mouth, mate? Yeah. I've got the chest. Please. It seems that you're going on and on That's and on, and there's no sign of, of any let up, but you've got to keep going until the paramedics arrive. Because if you don't, Three then you're just giving up on that person. We got her breathing again, put her back into the recovery position. But as soon as right. we got her in the right. recovery position, she uh, stopped breathing. Right on her back. That's it. A year earlier, we'd seen a man collapsed in the street. Uh, PC resuscitated that man, and we thought, why can't we do this? Uh, when we got back to the station, we asked our supervisor, and six months down the line, he sent us on a first aid course. Uh, it was the first time oh. we'd used Two. the knowledge gained on a course. Oh. Uh, it gave us a lot of confidence. I put two calls in for the ambulance, and it seemed like I was waiting for hours. And then when I heard the sirens, right. it was like winning a jackpot. There's the ambulance, Kev. Can we keep going? Oh, smashing. It's beautiful. It's, it's like the cavalry coming over the hill. You know, you see the blue lights and the sirens, and think, thank Not God for that. Yeah, I honestly didn't think the lady would make it. I thought we, we tried our best, and there's, there's no way we'd, you know, she'd see another day. It was about an hour after that that we heard that Nora was fine. She was being moved on to a ward, and we thought, oh, that's absolutely superb. You, know, you think, that's really brilliant, you know? 
Well, when I came out of hospital, I thought, right, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm just going to be an invalid for the rest of my life. But not now. I'm up and I'm about and I feel ten times better. I think I've been given a second chance for some reason. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, I don't know, but I hope it's the lottery. Traffic wardens have a bad press, uh, but we're real people. We're just normal, under the uniform, and it's nice to make oh. a difference. <laughs> 999 has previously featured the work of a unit unique in Britain. It's called the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service, HEMS for short, and it was set up here at the Royal London Hospital as a way of getting doctors and paramedics directly to the scene of an emergency, taking the hospital to the roadside and giving patients a head start in the recovery process. But one Christmas, a man was so badly injured that he took his last breath as the helicopter team arrived. The only thing Dr Sean Keogh and his colleagues could do was to carry out surgery there by the side of the road. It was a difficult and controversial decision because the technique that they were forced to use had never been successful outside a hospital operating theatre. OK, first slice of the Christmas cake coming up. Thank you very much, Al. Happy Christmas to you. Have a treat. Next nice. one. It was Christmas Eve and we'd had quite a busy morning and we'd just got back from the last call. One of our colleagues' mothers had brought up some Christmas cake and we were just starting to have a bit of a celebration. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm starving. In North London, two brothers and a friend were about to enjoy their festive lunch. Actors play the part of Moffid and Moyad al Jassas. Diane Foreman plays herself. I've known Moffid and Moyad for quite some time. They're Iraqi refugees. Christmas Eve, everybody gets together and has lunch. It's sort of tradition. I'm going to garage down the road. You get me something. Moyad and I have decided to go up and order the lunch from the local Indian restaurant. We were in there ordering the food and Moyed wandered over to see what had happened to his car because he was afraid that the parking wardens would clamp it or stick a ticket on it. But something was seriously wrong. Well, the call now, though, look like the fairy godmother, right? Fresh cup of coffee, that normally guarantees a call. Moffid, who moments earlier had been fit and healthy, was now close to death. I saw my brother and I ran to him, say, what's happened? What's happened? Tell me, uh, it's something happened. I've been uh, attacked on what? Tell me what's happened. He just say, I've been hitting with something heavy on my chest. I am! I am! It's Bobby! Bobby, he's been hit! My brother, he's been hit! He's been hit in the chest! What he meant was that he'd been hit by somebody uh, and that he had a wound in his chest. Call the police! Call the ambulance! Muffin! Muffin! Hello, Hems Operations. The London Ambulance Service took the call. With a reported stabbing and life in immediate danger, they also alerted Hems. He was going very ashen. I took my coat off, I remember doing that, and put it under his head. I gathered that there was a knife wound by this time because the blood was spreading through his clothes. On the HEMS team were Dr Sean Keogh, who dealt with similar incidents in South Africa's townships, and paramedic Alan Norman. Hang on there, Moffitt. Come on, what? Moffitt. What? 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 Oh, God. Oh, God. He just called me, I'm dying. Run quickly. Get me my, my, my son, Majid. I want to see him last. I want to see, look at him last look. I'm going to die. And I was saying, no, you're not going to die. Don't you dare die. And I was thinking to myself all of this time, I must keep him conscious, I must keep him fighting, because otherwise he'll just lose it. We drew up. The patient looked like he wasn't going to make it. He was actually dying. And you could actually see that from the cab of the ambulance. The patient's breathing was, was very bad, about four breaths a minute. Um, you ch I checked his pupils, and the pupils were dilating. That's an indication there's like massive blood loss from somewhere, be it external or internal. We can hear hems um, hovering, hovering above, so at least we knew that help was, wasn't too far and we just had to try and do the best for the patient. The hems team arrived within eight minutes. Sean Keogh knew he'd need his previous experience of treating victims of violent crime. I actually really came across major acute injuries in South Africa in Soweto and that has a lot of trauma, mainly from knives and gunshots, and that's where most of my experience came from. 
We actually arrived to the patient. It became obvious that he was severely injured. He had a terrible colour. He was gasping his last breaths. And I asked Alan to go to the head of the patient, check his airway, while I listened to the chest. I listened to the chest, and actually the chest movement was normal, which at first reassured me. I thought, well, perhaps this is not so serious. I then noticed where the stab wound was on the left side of the chest. There were two of them. One of the things you do consider when you go into such a stabbing is whether you should actually open the chest. Now, this is almost never necessary. I was hoping that in this case it wasn't because you know that if you ever get to that stage, it's very likely the patient is going to die. And it's the last thing you want to do on a cold, dark Christmas afternoon. I'm just going to intubate him. He's actually stopped breathing. But it was obvious to us that he was actually dying, and he died probably within one minute of our arrival. Um, he lost all his blood pressure, his pulses couldn't be felt anywhere, and he stopped breathing entirely. And as far as I was concerned, it was fairly clear that if we did not do some drastic thing to him now to sort his chest out, he was never going to live again. I saw him, he looked like a dead person. He's got no feeling, nothing. I just... I just feel sorry my brother's dead. It didn't occur to me to be squeamish about blood or anything. It was just a friend that was lying there in terrible trouble. You will agree this guy's dead, yeah? Okay. In Soweto, Sean had learned a technique with only limited chance of success. It was Christmas Eve and it's my birthday and when the doctor said he was going to open this patient up, I just couldn't believe it because it just made the day yuck, really. But then he was dead in front of us, so there's nothing else to do but to open him up to try to save his life. Okay. Officer, yes. we're going to need some blood. Going to go Everyone to became involved in the race to bring Moffat back to life. Negative, They'd just a few minutes to get his heart restarted and oxygen hold pumping to his brain. The first thing to do to Moffat was to raise his left arm above his head to give us clear access to his chest. Right, we've got some suction ready. Making a cut from the breastbone down to underneath his left armpit, across the breastbone and down to underneath his right armpit. We have to make such a large cut because it's important for us to be able to see what we're doing in it on a gloomy right, afternoon. That that Once that stage is complete, we can pass a thin, flexible wire, which is known as a jiggly saw here, from the left to the right, and saw the motion left to right with your hands. One, yeah. two, three. Right. Okay, right, dead. It was fairly easy for Alan to put his hands into the chest and pull the ribs apart, up and down. Once the chest was opened, the most obvious finding was the heart surrounding by a tense sack. And this was full of blood, and the blood was actually squashing the heart flat. And the most important thing to do straight away was to release the pressure on the heart so it could start to beat again, hopefully. Once that had happened, there was a big gush of blood, uh, much of it was actually clotted, out into his chest cavity. There's a hole in there. Yeah, there's a hole. There was about a two centimetre wound in Moffitt's heart, just to the left of this vessel here which obviously needed stitching up. So I asked Alan to pass me a suture. I stitched that up. Uh, that, that was quite easy to do. And then went back to pumping the heart by hand because he needed this to actually pump oxygenated blood to his brain because our main worry was actually brain damage at this point. Even if he survived, what was he going to turn out like? If you place a hand in the front and behind the heart and pump your hands together, that pumps blood around the body and especially to the brain. Uh, Moffat was loaded onto a trolley by the ambulance men, and it was still important to keep pumping his heart. OK, it's time to get him out of here. The care that he got was absolutely beyond all words. I mean, to think that they can do something like that on the road to save him. The guy died, they resuscitated him. Uh, once upon a time, that kind of thing is absolutely unheard of. We got to the helicopter and quickly loaded him, carrying on pumping his heart with our hands. And then I went round to the opposite door. Alan got in with the patient, pumping him, and I connected him to the ventilator as we flew him back to the London hospital. It was almost like a relief. Really, the patient was now in the helicopter and the patient was away. We were left to doing the tidying up. And Griff asked me, did I think the patient was going to survive? And I sort of said, if that patient survived, I'm going to believe in Father Christmas. Do you need extra blood? Sean and Alan took it in turns to massage Moffitt's heart to keep his blood circulating. When they reached the hospital, they'd pumped it at least two and a half thousand times. As we arrived at the London hospital, uh, still his heart was not beating at all. It was in this chaotic rhythm that we really needed to sort out with some electricity. So we loaded him onto a stretcher, took him down to the recess room, 
and applied paddles to the front and back of his heart and a small electric current across these paddles changed his chaotic heart rhythm into actually a normal heart rhythm. Obviously, I was really happy to see his heart beating, but I still had in the back of my mind, have we actually brought somebody back with a beating heart but who's brain dead or severely brain damaged? And that's a major worry. Moffitt was in intensive care for 17 days. His family could only wait for an improvement in his condition. The first sign came after four days. And he started opening his eyes, moving his fingers, moving his hands, looking at his wife, and he could obviously recognise his wife. And from that, it was all um, go, and he improved very dramatically after that. 24 days after Mofid al Jassas died on a North London street, he was released from hospital. He's made a most wonderful recovery considering the extent of his injuries. And obviously he's not 100% yet, but he's well on, on the way. I feel that I am the luckiest man in the world. There is no one um, luckier than me. Allah. <laughs> because I am around my children. <laughs> Dr. Shonkia is a bird of heaven. He kept trying. He kept trying with impossible. And he did it. He managed to do it. And I thank him very much. When I saw the air ambulance coming, I believe in God. And I believe God said an angel to my brother to save his life. Despite an extensive police inquiry, no one knows who stabbed Moffid or why. But his recovery was remarkable. He's the first person in the United Kingdom known ever to have survived heart surgery outside hospital. Opening the chest on the street is a last ditch attempt at life and it's unlikely to work. And when we get to the stage of doing the operation on the street, we know it's unlikely to work, but it is a small chance for the patient. And we believe it's worth the effort to give the patient that small chance of life. British waterways manage 1,800 miles of navigable rivers and canals, so even though there's 21,000 licensed boats on them, it's not too difficult to get away from the crowds. If you hire a boat like this, you get a short induction, but the rest is common sense. There's no driving test. The Bateman family were boat owners, so they were used to negotiating locks like that one. They're all strong swimmers and experienced in navigation, but all their skills were to prove of no use at all when one perfect summer's evening on the River Trent near Nottingham, a momentary loss of concentration turned a peaceful holiday into a nightmare. The first two days were fine, and the only dry day we had went up in smoke. We were going to have a job to get out. I expected the boat to explode. To see the fear on those people's faces, and they were all appealing to me to do something, was the most horrible thing I've ever seen, I think, in my life. We'll stop in a minute, love. Edna and Harry Bateman were on holiday with their daughter, Glynis. Also on their boat that day were their granddaughters, Kylie, aged six, and her elder sister, Melissa. They're all played by actors. I've worked for the board 37 years. I don't think there's another job, really, that, that I would have wanted to have done. It's very quiet. Margaret's always been there with me. We share it as a pair, as a team. Me and John have had three children. We've always lived near the water. And the, the family loved the water, same as the father. Well, I've, I've been diagnosed a diabetic for about 12 years now, and uh, I take insulin twice a day. I lead a normal, active life. Uh, run out of fuel. Well, I'll fill it up or it won't get out. Can't get out, we'll have to spend the rest of the holes here. We're going to Lincoln. Can you take Paul while we drop? Yeah. Well, Carly, you sit there next to brother. We'd run out of petrol. Oh, I was thinking about to get the engine started again. So we could pull straight out. 
I'll never get into pilot light at all. That was a crucial mistake. And that's when it started, you know, the fumes out the petrol can hit the fridge because it was a gas light. Then the lot went up. You couldn't do nothing about it. Because a 15 gallon of petrol went. Then I heard the dog barking. And I thought, well, the kids are playing about. As I went out, the, a couple ran by as if something was wrong. And I saw the smoke from the boat. So I ran straight back into the house. Called 999. Well, one of them. The flame shot across. Lisa was standing on the back, because we were stationed there, like, and leaning on the wall. And flame hit the cannon, <laughs> like that, and she went and blew her in. As I fell in, my purse got caught around one of the propellers, and as I tried to pull it, it just wouldn't come undone. When I looked over, Carly was on the back, but there was, like, flames between me and her, so I panicked, let go of the boat, jumped up to it and took a nosedive into the well. Well, I broke my wrist. <coughs> so I fell on the petrol, which knocked it over, which spread it even worse. I thought I was going to drown because I couldn't get unraveled at first. So I started to panic. It seemed to take ages, and then... As, a, as I undone my strap thing and swam to the top. The flames were beginning to get more and more fierce. Smoke was beginning to appear. And uh, I'd got fear of them all burning to death. I, I laid down on my stomach and reached over, but by this time the boat was still going down in the lock at a rapid rate. Seeing a child in that uh, stressful situation uh, with appealing eyes looking up at me from the bows of the boat and her arms upstretched as if to say, pull me up, you know, come off this boat. And it, it, it's a terrible sensation when you, you think you can't do anything. Jump! Get in the water! The baby. Melissa and Kylie jumped in first, but Glynis couldn't move without her mother's help. I don't even know how I got her up. Um, I remember lifting her up and pushing her over the side in the water. And then when she went down, she didn't seem to come up straight away. And I screamed, Glynis. And I don't remember anything else after that. Jump! Jump! Get off the boat! Edna managed to step onto the ladder, but accidentally pushed the boat away. It was impossible for the others to follow her. John knew he had no choice but to break normal safety rules. We've been taught not to go into the water, but to try and do your best from off the bank to save people's lives, but not to endanger yourself. But uh, this was a completely different situation. Come on! Over here! Over here! They were terrific. They say we're hanging on a boat and ducking under to keep his head cool. Because it's scorching. The family were sheltering at the back of the boat, but it was being dragged towards the closed lock gates. John was trying to reach the family, but they couldn't swim because of their injuries. We can all swim, but at that time we couldn't because we were, say, Dad was in shock. Lisa had got a death grip on Carla, and she'd holding me up as well, so there was no way I could swim with broken arm anyway. I thought it was my responsibility to make sure she was all right and take care of her. So there's no way of letting anybody else hold her. The flames were really big. Red, yellow, blue. Black smoke, you know, thick black smoke. And the smell, terrible. It smelled like oil, but it was burning five glass. With yourself! With yourself! I remember a terrific explosion and the searing heat went straight across the top of my head, and it was unbelievable, the heat, and I just dived under the water. I thought you couldn't have an heart attack. You were breathing really funny, and it kept going under. Oh, God, Come on! I thought you were going to kick it. 
my brain was racing, what do I do next? I've still got to rescue all these people. I've still got to get them up onto that top of that lock side somehow. But all of a sudden, three life belts came down into the water. The lines are supposed to be attached to the shore so that you can pull people in and, and, and rescue them. But unfortunately, whoever threw these belts down threw down the three lines as well. So I gathered up the three lifelines and they all grasped hold of the life belts and I swam back across the lock, which is a long way when you're down there in a, a lock that's 30 feet wide and 200 feet long. It's a long way back to the ladder even. Right. I've got you. It was six hours since John had eaten anything. His blood sugar levels were dangerously low and he was getting very tired. And then the decision was, who goes up the ladder first? Who do we save first? Well, my reaction was the child. So I said, come on, you've got to, you and the child have got to go up that ladder. And they did, they got hold of the rungs and they gradually climbed up and to the top of the ladder, which was about a 12 foot lift. And then, I got the, the, the mother of those two, and she said she couldn't possibly get up there. And I said, you'll die if you don't, you'll die if you don't. You've got to get up that ladder. So she got hold of the ladder with a good arm, and then I, I got underneath her and I pushed her and pushed her, and we gradually got her right to the top, one rung at a time till we got to the top and safety. Somehow, John had found the energy to help the family. When he told me what he'd had to do, go under the water and the explosions and everything, I mean, he could have had a heart attack. I mean, all of them would have died then. All the family were treated for burns and shock. Glynis was the most seriously injured and spent six weeks in hospital. They're all still coming to terms with their experience. It was a terrible nightmare. I'd had them for over 12 months. I was a shoot of him buried, shouting fire, and sweat pouring out on me. It was terrible. There's something built into every human being that no matter who you are, and if you see someone in a stressful situation, you automatically, I think, try to do something for that person or those people. John received a Royal Humane Society Bravery Award for his actions that day. Well, I hope people who are looking to see this programme over there take notice. Not to carry petrol like that. Or if they do, keep it in a safer place and not near a naked light like I did. My mistake. Nine 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 returns to BBC One with a new series of rescue reconstructions next year.